2022 forced pretty much every gamer ever to compare Elden Ring against God of War, whether it be due to game quality or even their similarities and differences, whatever. But one thing that was on my mind, and maybe some of yours, was what if Kratos had to actually face the Elden Ring pantheon, like the pantheon of gods he has faced so many times before. The comparison was begging to happen, with Elden Ring presenting a very old school Greek and Nordic-esque pantheon of gods and demigods of its own that has its own unique story and lore that the ghosts of Sparta could easily be chucked against. Throughout the God of War series, Kratos earned his infamy via his conquest over the Greek pantheon, gods of immense power lording over the lands, magic, and multiple realms comprising their universe. Lords of death, the sun, the skies, all eventually fell to Kratos' bloodlust, whether it be the titans, the former great powers of the lands, or his own father Zeus, the ghost of Sparta proved all but unstoppable until his homeland lay all but utterly destroyed. It was only after facing his self granted penance that Kratos became a very different god of war in the modern age, and with death still out of Kratos' reach, even by his own hand, he'd eventually make his way to the Norse realms, which is a collection of worlds distinct from the set of worlds he'd known all his life prior. While it is debated heavily whether or not this rugged, aged Kratos possesses less power than his younger self, it's safe to say that his experiences make him much less likely to express whatever strength he may still actually possess. Despite this and his possibly weakened state, the former god of war still manages to defeat and conquer many belonging to this new pantheon of foes, the god of light, thunder, the Allfather, and a new host of demons and mythical monsters are still either bested by or pushed to the brink by Kratos and company. So the question is, could Kratos in a similar way to how he eventually adapted to and besieged the unfamiliar Nordic worlds, conquer the strange and otherworldly threats that would face him in the lands between and the differences that he would have to eventually adapt to and overcome? If you've been following me for a bit, you know I have many, many god of war videos on this channel and due to the complexity of elden ring's lore it will take some time to describe how it really boils down in this type of contest and analysis not only that but if you think the lore is complicated power scaling it is next level i also want to say as a disclaimer in this video we will be charitable with the lore so for instance when it says star scourge radon challenged and halted the stars we're going to be considering them actual stars and trying to ignore game mechanics over lore. As I've said in my own God of War videos, game concessions sort of nerf how things can look, even though in the lore it's clearly a higher scale or whatever, due to what you can actually present in the game without ruining its flow or design. So we will be charitable to the lore in this video, and since the premise of this video is mainly how Kratos would interact and adapt in the lands between, I can safely say that if he was put on a hunt for the demigods to mend the Elden Ring or even destroy it, that he would undoubtedly face the likes of Godric the Grafted, Renala, Queen of the Full Moon, and or Star Scourge Radon, as I mentioned before. Unlike the Tarnished of No Renown, also known as the player character who is vaguely a warrior of some unknown caliber in the past that didn't even let him gain any renown, Kratos is just a straight up actual god and god slayer, wielding many weapons that can slay gods and much more. So it's safe to assume, even just kind of off the dome, that Kratos could handle the many early threats of Elden Ring. Even the strongest demigod of the Shattering in the Lands between, Radon, became so famous and considered powerful because he was able to combat the stars, the rotations, and halt fate itself with the power of his gravity magics. Compare that to Kratos facing off against Baldur, who could three-tap the World Serpent, who alongside Thor could splinter the Yggdrasil that holds and transcends all the space of the nine realms of the Nordic worlds, or even possibly scaling to an Amp Surtur, who created every star in the cosmos of nine realms, or facing Odin, who with spear in hand, created seven realms with the discarded corpse of his titanic foe, Ymir. Now, while this could have just been the planets and not the actual space, as Surtur threw all the stars into the space, so Odin didn't create all of it, it still is kind of impressive to think about. In comparison, even the strongest legends of the demigods don't really compare to Kratos, even with simple analysis, especially since these demigods are all decrepit, fallen off, and insane, and obviously much weaker than their old legends, to a degree that Kratos 
Kratos could never even dream of. And with Kratos having these god-slaying weapons, he could easily have weapons capable of dishing out the needed power to slay these entities. And if he acquired shards of the Elden Ring from them, they would only amplify his strength further and make him even more relevant and fitting in the scaling of the verse on top of this. An example, imagine if Kratos slayed Godric the Grafted and with his anchor, Great Rune amped himself like he does with Tears of the Yggdrasil in God of War 4 and 5. And you have to remember in God of War 4 and 5, he's also not in his home territory. He's not in Greece. He still adapts and amps himself with the things native to the area. So he would in character actually use Great Runes to probably amp himself as well if he was aware of them. It is then safe to say that he would eventually be faced with Morgoth, the Grace Given, and Landell, who he would ultimately slaughter just like he could Radon. Many think Morgoth is stronger than Radon due to the opening cinematic showing a flashback of him and his Margit alias defeating Radon and defending the capital city of Landell. However, this is Radon in a weaker state, probably before he grew massive in size, challenged all the stars above Celia in Kylid with his new training, and before he was considered the strongest demigod of all. Even then, Kratos would literally chop a scarlet rot ridden Radon in half with one slash of the Blades of Chaos, so it would absolutely be no contest with Morgoth either. I doubt Morgoth can do that. And traversing the rot ridden swamps of Kylid would also probably be no problem as well, as he would never have to really interact with its swamps and could easily slay all of its inhabitants. You have to remember that Scarlet Rot is burned away with fire, and Kratos is kind of imbued with it. For now, with Kylid, he could easily and realistically, kind of avoid it entirely, and easily fling himself to Radon. After defeating Morgoth, Kratos would be presented with the challenge of the Erd Tree itself. The Erd Tree was clearly inspired by Berserk's World Tree and by the Yggdrasil from Norse mythology. However, it is very different in its nature. Rather than being a tree that holds up and transcends the time-space of the realms, it is a tree from which life all originated from in primordial times, and then was blessed by an outer and higher being called the Great will, which split apart all life and things to create order, and then sending a beast bearing the Elden Ring to ensure these things would remain as they are. And due to this, the Erd Tree, while not nearly the same scale and size as the Yggdrasil, possesses many unique properties that would be sort of weird to deal with for Kratos, and would require certain prerequisites to defeat or actually handle. Most particularly to actually get inside of it and pass the Elden Lord Radagon's impenetrable thorns at its base that deny access to its inner areas to anything in the lands between, which denies all access to the Elden Ring itself. Fire is anathema to the Erd Tree, with the Flames of Ruin being what would eventually burn it down in prophecy and in the actual events of the game. There's absolutely nothing else that can destroy it because the Flame of Ruin is a godlike, divine, infested flame that specifically counters it, generated from a specific one-eyed deity. Even other godly ordained powers, such as Scarlet Rot, the flames of frenzy or formless blood magics can't actually do anything to this tree. So it may be fair to say that the Blades of Chaos are also a divine flame that can slay gods, so it probably at least functions similarly to the Flame of Ruin. However, even then it is too contrived to say it would just burn the tree down for a simple reason. The tree is flat out immortal. What I mean by that is it doesn't even possess the concept needed for it to burn or even be damaged. So when the player character finally does engulf the tree, even with the literal anathema or counter to it on a divine level, it's still not actually enough to burn it because it doesn't even possess the qualities needed to die. The fundamental concept of death is removed from the world and needs to be restored. So while I would say it's fair to say the Blades of Chaos should at least work similarly or at least could probably even do more than the Flame of Ruin being charitable, it is somewhat disingenuous to say Kratos would just burn the tree down without reintroducing the lands between to death once again. And this is especially true when you you consider Kratos' fight with an actual cursed immortal like Baldur, and he was completely unable to kill him without removing his immortality, even though the concept of death itself clearly existed in Midgard when they battled, and that in God of War Ragnarok, he completely lost all his magics from Greece, this was confirmed, including his old powers from the God of Death and so forth that he had only taken certain aspects of even then. However, death still existed without Thanatos, the God of death in Greece, just like the ocean still existed without Poseidon, the god of the seas. However, an Elden Ring, without the rune of death, or destined death, 
there is no death. It doesn't just go haywire. It just doesn't exist. It is a more fundamentally important and literal concept of the word, not bound by just a God's name or will, but a reality that must be overcome and dealt with for Kratos. But that doesn't mean Kratos can't get the Elden Ring. You will have to travel to Faramazula, just like the Tarnished of Gnome Renown in Elden Ring. And this is most accomplished by interacting with the Giant's Forge, which holds the Flame of Ruin we've been talking about, and then burning the Erd Tree with it, and then being transported there. If Kratos has any guidance towards this objective, which there are many characters in Elden Ring that may straight up guide him if he starts slaying demigods one by one, think of your meanings with Melina, Vare, or even Gideon Ofnir. He could definitely and realistically eventually learn of it and if any sane character takes interest in what he's doing which let's be honest they 100% definitely would. Kratos defeating the fire giant is not much of a different issue as he guards the forge, but just like the previous demigods, as even when god amped, it is not noted as anything unique other than almost a god by the warrior Jar Alexander. The fire giants with these god powers being slayed and fought by many beings and warriors you could defeat easily and even before slaughtering gods like Radon. Kratos also possesses the qualities needed to guide the flame of ruin to the Erd tree as he possesses and walks alongside his own inner flames and literal flames of chaos. In God of War Ragnarok, Kratos is able to combine his flames with the fire giant Surtur and create Ragnarok with him. And if the flames ruin do the same with Kratos, they could easily engulf the Erd Tree and send him to Pharah Missoula to slay death, just like the Tarnished in Elden Ring. Funny enough, the events of Ragnarok in Elden Ring are actually very similar in this Ragnarok burning event. But with Elden Ring, the Ragnarok is burning the Erd Tree down as it's what represents the gods. And this is where Kratos would finally begin to struggle as this is where the concepts of death and timeless beings actually begin to really appear. Faramazula is home to very ancient powerhouses and most particularly Malekith the Black Blade who wields the concept of death within his very body and an ancient timeless Elden Lord named Dragon Lord Placidusax. In this case Kratos would never have to face Placidusax but Malekith and the characters after him definitely somewhat at least scale to that old Elden Lord. And Placidusax is important because his very scales warp time and space and allow any weapon to become a god slaying one, just one scale off of his body. He himself sits in a vortex or a chasm outside of time entirely and it's called a chasm in the original Japanese and meaning anything that happens there is happening in absolutely zero time. Any movement, attack, or battle would happen outside of time, meaning anything that could move there either can distort time enough to the point that it doesn't matter, which might be implied via the scale's description, or is just simply fast enough to be able to fight when time doesn't exist. And this is a crazy concept as there is no final speed capable of accomplishing this without weird warping arguments or concepts. Example being, think of how the speed formula actually works, that being distance divided by time. This formula would, in this case, break down, seeing as there is no time to exist in the formula, yet distance is still traveled. This would essentially place Placidusax's speed, or the tarnished of no renown who faces him, beyond any potential calculation, as the nature of this realm puts it beyond the mean with which we can even typically determine his speed. It sort of goes beyond what we know of in just normal physics. Even if you said it was the biggest number which people usually consider Googleplex or whatever and multiplied that by another Googleplex and then multiplied that by the speed of light, it wouldn't even be remotely close to moving in zero time. The idea almost breaks speed entirely and makes it disgustingly broken for a character to be able to do. So for Kratos to face Malekith and not just get turbo blitzed and chopped to a trillion pieces by the concept of death, he would need to have speed capable of reacting to this level, which if he has been gaining the shards of the Elden Ring, he may be able to actually do naturally at this point anyway, but if not, he still would be very much on this tier, even in his own games. And this is due to the fact that in Greece, the Primordials were a 
type of deity that existed before the creation of the universe and created the universe itself with their battles. With later gods like Kronos, the father of Zeus, taking on the mantle of creating and handling time, meaning these primordials could also fight in voids of zero time and had gigantic titanic battles outside of it just like Placidus Acts, if not even more blatantly as the concept literally wasn't even made yet. They made time. The Greek gods then become stronger than the primordials and Kronos and take their place. As Maybe while they are not as fundamental, in terms of strength and scaling, they should be able to contend with those beings whom Kratos eventually reaches the level of. Even if for whatever reason Kratos is stronger or weaker in Ragnarok, he still faces high-level gods of the Nordic pantheon, and certain writers of God of War like to imply some pantheon relativity, so it wouldn't be too crazy that Kratos could still face old Greek gods that at least contend at all with their primordial. Good example of this, look at Thor hitting the world serpent so hard, he just bonks him out of existence back into time. Like, it's not a special ability or anything. He actually just hits him so hard and fast, it breaks reality and he poofs away like he's in a meme. Kratos then gets hit by much stronger and more serious attacks and nothing happens to him. I think it's fair to say Kratos could face Malekith, but the issue is if he can contend with Destined Death. Destined Death is a weird concept, but I don't think it's an instant win condition. Destined Death in gameplay seems to grant an exposed death to whatever it touches. With Death coming faster and more gradually the longer you are exposed. There is even a canonical health nerf effect from getting hit by it, implying it has effects from you not dying to it in one attack. Therefore, I think it's more like Malekith has the ability to grant death to Kratos, but I also don't think it's realistic unless you think that the death Malekith grants is beyond all space and time entirely, on a level beyond concepts, which it may be. But Kratos in God of War 3 uses the concept of hope and is actually able to shatter and bully the concept of fear, but by the time 4 and 5 come around, that concept is a shard and fraction of its former self. Right, that, that sure. there is a desire, that little bit of hope that he didn't give to mankind, that he left inside of there, but locked way deep inside. And this is what originally was stated to keep him from dying all the time. So it's hard to say how he would handle a concept like death in the current games that can also kill concepts anyway. However, the reason I think Kratos would still take this, especially in this situation, is because even normally he is probably too much for something like even the Elden Beast and the gods, let alone a Kratos that probably has acquired and amped himself with literal Elden Ring great shards that basically brought a nobody to this level to begin with. Let's say Kratos did get past Malekith, Godfrey, and Radagon, just for argument and time's sake, and the Elden Beast showed up. The Elden Beast, even in its highest realistic interpretation, represents and generates an image of order that is shown to hold up the cosmos and reality itself, with a large and massive Erd tree shooting into space to show this, the order it represents holds all things as they are. This is because the Greater Will, an outer god that created the Elden Ring to begin with, is noted by its counterpart, the god of chaos's vassal, the Three Fingers, who speaks for the opposite of the greater will, that it once split all things apart from one original thing to make all other things. It is a very similar story to Odin creating nine realms with the corpse of Ymir, but the greater will does it with the basis of all reality and everything itself from the one great, the original only thing. Then using order, order keeps these things as all things separate, with the concept of order being the Elden Beast, also known as the Elden Ring. However, what happens in God of War is far more impressive than this showing of holding up and maintaining the universe, seeing as even the prior mentioned primordials pretty much create the multitude of realms in the Greek world of God of War. As described by both the game staff and the games themselves, the Greek and Norse lands act as kind of pocket dimensions separate from each other, yet containing multiple universe-sized spaces within them, such as Hades, which is described as infinite. The universe with which Greece and the actual worlds lay within Elysium, Thanatos' realm, and Mount Olympus are all either described or implied to be infinite in scope and would essentially represent a kind of multiverse within just the Greek realm, which is potentially the same case as with the Yggdrasil and the nine realms hosted within, with Kratos, of course, scaling above being stronger than the primordials such as either the titans or the god of olympuses who usurped the former. Even Atlas, who Kratos directly scales above on screen, has similar lore and feats to the Elden Beast, that being 
holding up at least the entire living world or main universe containing Greece. With Odin and Ragnarok was also stated to have slain Ymir, then using the body to craft the potentially infinite in scope Nine Realms, with Kratos even in that game at least scaling to Odin, seeing as he did put up a fight against the Allfather alongside Atreus and Freya. There's also the other argument as well that it seems as though things existed before the Elden Beast was sent to the Lands Between, implying the Lands Between existed before the Elden Beast came, which also makes it a lot more contentious. However, Elden Ring does have a bit of an out though, and that is the fun game of interpretation. The Outer Gods of Elden Ring are clearly influenced and inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's eldritch entities in many capacity, whether it be simply perceiving them causes you to go insane, like the, the Flame of Frenzy or the Chaos God. They are too great to interact with the worlds themselves and must interact with it via avatars or vassals, and they are summoned with rituals, whether it be their influence is charged by the alignments of the stars or planets or whatever. They are also literally called outer gods, which I cannot make up, is an eldritch term. It is fair to say that they at least are higher beings that don't exist within the main universe itself, or else they'd probably just show up whenever they wanted and wouldn't have to do all these shenanigans to interact with things. And while I think it's very likely that these are at least the bare minimum higher dimensional or higher entities, it does not really mean anything for the Elden Beast and the nature of the Outer Gods would never interact with Kratos, even if he turbo slayed the entire lands between and made all of them very angry. However, if you do think that they are clearly Eldritch inspired and beyond the concepts of space and time and even created all these concepts, then it may be possible that the Elden Beast being an extension of one and representing a concept of order to hold up all that is in place and then being an extension of the greater will making all things even in higher realms then it may extend just beyond the Elden Beast being in the universe and even to higher realms its effect might be even greater but this is a huge stretch as even the Elden Beast holding up the universe is probably contentious and I'm mainly saying it to be generous as it does sort of add up when you consider a much weaker Radon could hold up potentially constellations so I think in the end it would realistically go once again being charitable the outer gods then Kratos, then the gods, and then the demigods. Just in all honesty, and considering the author's intent with these gods and pantheons, I think that is a fair conclusion. I mean, look at Bloodborne. It is literally an HP Lovecraft fan fiction, let alone these outer gods beyond the universe. Due to the fact Kratos would never have to actually face a full power outer god, it doesn't stop him from getting the Elden Ring and honestly being the victor in this matchup. A big shout out to my editor, Crisis for being very patient and helpful with this whole process, as well as Key Issues Garrick, who helped me with a lot of uh, God of War Ragnarok stuff. Unfortunately, I was only able to play up to four, so he was very helpful with going over Ragnarok's story and a lot of things that happened in it because I didn't have time to play it yet. So big shout-outs to him. He has some God of War videos on his channel now you should check out as well. And if you do want me to at all do any more videos like this in the future about Souls or about God of War, just let me know down below. And otherwise, till next time.